Hello and welcome to this tutorial on VLANs and trunking. In the ICND1 material we talked about access ports and basic VLAN configuration. And you might remember we said a port in a VLAN is either an access port or it's a trunk port. Well here we're going to focus on the trunking because it's a, a very popular concept and you will come across it on just about any local area network where LAN switches are used. So we'll begin by taking a look at the purpose of trunking and then we'll move into how trunking actually works, the, the nitty gritty details. And we'll finish our discussion by looking at two methods that we can use to actually implement trunking on Cisco switches. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So why do we want to use trunking? Really, what's the purpose of trunking? Well, if you recall, an access port can belong to a single VLAN at a time. No more, no less. Only one VLAN is allowed on an access port. So let's say we have these two switches and we want to connect them because I want to go ahead and I want to create VLAN number one over on that switch as well. So if we're only using access ports, remember one VLAN per access port, if I run a connection between these two switches, the ports on both sides will have to be put into VLAN 1 so that we can carry all that traffic. Well that's great. We've accomplished our goal of connecting the switches and now VLAN 1 is, is united on both switches. But what about all the other VLANs? Let's say I go ahead and I now configure VLAN 2 over here because I'm having more and more users and I need to, I need to utilize all the switch ports that I can. Well, because this first link is an access port, I cannot run VLAN 2 over it. It's dedicated to VLAN 1. So I'll have to configure a port on each switch again and then dedicate that to VLAN 2 only. And I'll have to repeat this for every single VLAN that I want to connect between these two switches. So if I add VLAN 3 over here, well, I have to run another access port and configure it in VLAN 3. And now keep in mind we've only connected VLANs 1, 2, and 3 between the two switches. We haven't even begun to touch 7, 8, and 9. For those we'll have to run three more connections between these two switches. This is really wasteful. We're using a total of six ports on each switch just to connect the two, uh, uh, just to connect the switches together so that all the VLANs can communicate across both switches. Well, the main purpose of trunking is that it's very efficient. So an access port only has one, one VLAN on it. A trunk can carry multiple VLANs at a time. So if we wanted to connect these two switches together using a trunk link, we would only have to provision one link between the two switches and the ports on each side would not be access ports, they'd be configured as trunk ports. Now keep in mind a few things to note. A trunk can also exist between a switch and a router or sometimes even a switch and a server. It doesn't have to be between two switches only. So if you ever see a, a switch port that's configured as a trunk and it's going to a server, keep in mind that server might be running a virtual machine on there where there are many different subnets on that particular server. Or if it's running to a router, perhaps that router has sub interfaces configured and it's participating in the VLAN trunking. Okay, so just something to keep in mind there. With that said, let's actually go ahead now and take a look at how trunking works. Okay, so let's now, instead of drawing all of those access ports, let's go ahead and draw a single link between the two switches, and that is going to be our trunk. So the ports on each side are configured as trunk ports instead of access ports. This is much more efficient. We're only using up two ports on either side, which means all those other ports that we were using before, now we can actually use them for more devices. We've just saved ourselves a lot of money. One thing to note about trunks, is that by default when you configure one all VLANs are allowed to go over that trunk. In some of the configuration tutorials on trunks you'll learn that you can actually remove some of those VLANs, you can prevent them from using a trunk and then later on if you change your mind you can put them back on and, and allow them to use the trunk but by default all VLANs are allowed to use a trunk. Okay so let's say this is switch A and this is switch B 
and we have a user here in VLAN 2 and he sources a frame and it's determined that the destination is on switch B. Well when switch A sends that frame over the trunk and it's received by switch B, how does switch B know which VLAN that frame belongs to? Remember VLANs 1 through 7 can use that trunk so it can belong to any one of those particular VLANs. How does switch B figure it out? Well that brings us to how trunking actually works and, and it's a very simple mechanism. We use something called VLAN tagging and if you see here each VLAN we have seven one two three four five six seven the VLAN ID is the number of each VLAN so the VLAN ID of VLAN number one is the number one the VLAN ID of VLAN seven is seven the VLAN ID of VLAN five is five so on and so forth it's very obvious so we use that information and in fact we tag it to any of the frames we send across the trunk so here before switch A sends that frame and this is the Ethernet frame it's going to add a little bit of extra information to the frame and inside there it's going to put the VLAN ID and attach it to the frame and then it sends it on its way to switch B pretty simple right so now when switch B receives that frame it takes a look at this tag the VLAN tag it sees the VLAN ID inside and it and now it knows okay this frame belongs to VLAN number two I now know where to send it and it's as simple as that now keep in mind VLAN tagging is only used on trunks it's not used on access ports so if our destination is over here hanging off of an access port when that frame is sent over that port this tagging information is not on it and it kind of makes sense right because an access port can only belong to a single VLAN so it doesn't need this identification because any frame going over it is assumed to be in that single VLAN okay so you will not find VLAN tags on access ports and that's it really that is how simple VLAN tagging is and that is the whole uh, mechanism behind trunking and how trunking works we add information to each frame and now everything that traverses this trunk can be easily identified by both switches A and B so now that we know how it works let's take a look at two ways of actually implementing VLAN trunking so we have two methods of implementing VLAN tagging the first one is known as ISL and that stands for interswitch link now this is a Cisco proprietary method meaning it only works on Cisco devices and the way it works is it actually fully encapsulates the Ethernet frame in order to add the VLAN ID information so if we start with the original Ethernet frame ISL adds a special header and a special footer inside the header is where the VLAN tag will live the CRC the footer that stands for cyclical redundancy check that's just a way to uh, check for errors when the frame is received okay so ISL adds a header and a footer to the frame the original Ethernet frame that's the first method the second method is known as 802.1Q and this is an I3E standard meaning it can work on Cisco equipment and non Cisco equipment it's a, it's an open standard and 802.1Q is a lot more popular than ISL even though ISL was created before it in fact in some ways it seems like Cisco is moving away from ISL itself because there are even Cisco switches now that no longer support ISL so it seems like everyone has adopted or is in the process of fully adopting 802.1Q. Now this uh, method, 802.1Q, takes a different approach to VLAN tagging. If we look at our Ethernet frame again, but this time in a bit more detail, so whereas up here we didn't show the header and the frame check sequence, here we see it all. The 802.1Q method will go ahead and it won't add anything in terms of a new header or a new footer what it does is it actually injects some new information into the existing Ethernet frame header 
This is where it will go ahead and put the VLAN ID. It actually inserts it into the original header of the Ethernet frame. So this header is actually expanded a little bit because we're throwing in some more information there. The other thing that changes about this frame is the frame check sequence, the original footer to the Ethernet frame. Remember from the ICND1 material on Ethernet that the FCS uh, uses the size of the frame in order to make its calculations for error detection. Well, because we've just injected some new information and the, and the header size has changed, the frame check sequence needs to be recalculated before that frame is sent. And so that actually happens with 802.1Q. Okay, so inside the header, for instance, you would see the source MAC address, the destination MAC address, and then right after that, the VLAN ID is in the header. Okay, so two pretty different ways of actually implementing VLAN tagging. However, there are some things in common. Both of these methods support a large number of VLANs. In fact, they support 4,094 VLANs each. That means if you have a very large network with many VLANs, you can use either of these methods. Also, both of these support multiple instances of the spanning tree protocol. If you haven't yet seen that tutorial on STP, after watching it, you'll understand how running multiple instances gives you a lot more flexibility and performance enhancements. So that's a very good characteristic that both uh, methods support. Now, aside from the differences uh, that we talked about in terms of actually implementing the tagging itself, there's one other big difference between these two methods, and that's known as the use of the native VLAN. You might have heard about the native VLAN before, and it's a little bit of a, it's, it's slightly a confusing topic, so we'll cover it here so that you know about it going forward. On one hand, it's very simple. 802.1Q uses the concept of the native VLAN, and ISL does not use it. So right off the bat, one does and one doesn't. That's the simple part. Let's now actually take a closer look at, at uh, native VLAN to, to really explain it. Let's look back at this example, and we'll put our trunk in between these two switches. And obviously, this is an 802.1Q trunk. Well, as we know, all of the frames will be tagged with the VLAN ID. That's how 802.1Q works. But let's say switch B cannot support 802.1Q. Or switch A is connected to a server. Let's say that it's a virtual machine. There are a bunch of different uh, servers running on there. And that server cannot support 802.1Q. Are we completely out of luck? Uh, will these even function? And, and the answer is yes, they will actually function, and we are in luck because that's the great thing about native VLAN in 802.1Q. So quite simply, the native VLAN is used to carry frames over an 802.1Q trunk that do not have any VLAN tagging information. So if this server cannot tag anything, at the very least, it can still send and receive frames that are not tagged and they are transported in the native VLAN. So what does that mean? All it means is that if switch A receives a frame and there's no VLAN tagging information on it, it just assumes, okay, that frame belongs to the native VLAN. Now at least I know where to put that frame. That's it. So at least we get some basic functionality there. Now here's where it gets a little bit confusing. By default, the VLAN ID of the native VLAN is VLAN 1. So VLAN 1 is by default the native VLAN for 802.1Q trunks. You don't have to use VLAN 1. And in fact, there are many best practices which state you should change it from VLAN 1. So you can configure which VLAN you want to use as your native VLAN on a particular trunk. The catch is both sides have to be configured the same. So if you change the native VLAN to 5 on this side, then you have to change it to 5 on that side as well. Okay, so that's it really. That is the concept of the native VLAN. It gives us some functionality when VLAN tagging is not possible, and those frames are put into that special VLAN, the native VLAN. And we do that because when the switch receives it, it now knows what to do with it, right? Because it has no tag on it. And like we said earlier, if the switch doesn't have a tag, it doesn't know what to do with that frame. So this is kind of like the default catch-all. It's like the bucket, and it goes ahead and just throws it into the native VLAN.
To summarize what we covered, we now know that trunking is used because it's very efficient. Instead of running a dozen or more access ports between two switches, we can use a single trunk and that will carry all of the VLANs. And by default, all VLANs can use a trunk. Now the way we identify traffic is known as VLAN tagging and quite simply we just put the VLAN ID onto a frame uh, that uh, is sent over a trunk and that way the receiving switch knows what VLAN that frame belongs to. It's a pretty simple method. And we now know that there are two, two ways to implement VLAN tagging. There's a Cisco method of ISL where we fully encapsulate, or there's the I3E method, the open standard 802.1Q, where we just inject that VLAN ID information into the original Ethernet frame header. Now there are some similarities and differences uh, in addition to that, and one of them is the use of the native VLAN. 802.1Q uses it, ISL does not. And now we know that the native VLAN is simply the VLAN that is used for all of the traffic on a trunk, an 802.1Q trunk, that is not tagged. It does not have any VLAN ID information. Okay, so that's it. That is VLANs and trunking. Thanks for watching.